A father has many roles when it comes to his family. A father is supposed to support his children, provide for the family, and most importantly, protect his children. So it becomes shocking when a father commits what is considered the worst mass murder in Fresno history by slaughtering nine of his children in cold blood. Join me while we look at Marcus Wesson and the murder of his entire family. Marcus Wesson was born on August 22, 1946, in Kansas, to Benjamin and Carrie Wesson. His mother was extremely religious, and in turn, he was raised as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. His father was an alcoholic and regularly abused his wife and children. When Wesson was a child, Benjamin abandoned the family, some saying he left to live with another man. In the 1960s, the family moved to San Bernardino, California, where Wesson would attend high school. He dropped out of high school at 17 years old and joined the Army, serving from 1966 to 1968, leaving with an honorable discharge. After the Army, Wesson moved to San Jose and moved in with a friend at the time named Rosemary Maturina and her eight children. Wesson and Rosemary would go on to have a son together in 1971. A couple of years after his son was born, Wesson started spending more time with Rosemary's eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Rosemary approved of this relationship, only asking that the two wait until Elizabeth was of legal age before they married. They ended up getting married when Elizabeth was 15, and four months later, Elizabeth gave birth to their first child. They went on to have 10 more children together. Elizabeth's sister was unable to care for her seven children due to the fact that she was heavily involved with drugs and ended up leaving her children with Weston and Elizabeth to care for. Weston was extremely abusive to his wife and children. He prevented Elizabeth from participating in the children's upbringing. He insisted on keeping the girls and boys separate at all time, and all of the children were permitted from speaking to their mother. The children were homeschooled by Wesson. He used flashcards, school textbooks, and his own twisted truths to teach the children. He also taught the children from a handwritten Bible that focused on Jesus Christ being a vampire. He was fascinated with vampires and even gave the family vampire nicknames. He taught his children that he was God and that he was to be referred to as Master or Lord and also taught the children how to prepare for Armageddon. Along with these teachings, he also taught the girls that they were destined to become his wives. During their childhood, the children were given strict rules to follow both in and out of the house. Outside of the house, the women wore black skirts, white or gray blouses, and black heels. They were required to look down at all times and not talk to anyone in passing. If anyone spoke out of turn, or if any of his rules were broken, they would get beat. He would beat them with tree branches, cords, baseball bats, his fists, or anything else that he could find. One of his sons recalls Wesson digging a grave in the yard and telling the boy that if he made one wrong move, the grave would be for him. Another son recalls being beaten for 30 days straight for stealing a spoonful of peanut butter. He wouldn't just beat the boys, the girls would also get beatings. When his daughter turned nine years old, he started to sexually abuse her. Elizabeth protested this, and in turn, she was choked until she blacked out. His niece, Sophina, once tried to run away from the family and was stabbed in the chest for her attempt. Along with the physical abuse, Weston also sexually abused two of his daughters and three of his nieces around the age of nine, resulting in all of the girls getting pregnant at some point. He even had wedding ceremonies with them, where they would place their hands on the Bible and recite marriage vows. Despite the way that the family was living, the children remember having fun memories with Wesson, including entertainment and games. The family would have game nights, family plays, concerts, and contests. Their favorite contest was called the Ugly Contest, where the children would dress up in the ugliest clothing to see who would win. The family seemed to have fun, but most of the time, they struggled. Wesson was unable to hold a steady job and instead relied on welfare and scavenging in order to survive. Once the children started to work, they were required to give Wesson their entire paycheck. The family would live in rundown shacks, 
boats, tents, vacant houses, and a school bus that they traveled around with. They lived in two different boats at one point. One of the boats was a 26-foot boat that was in the Santa Cruz Harbor. On this boat, the children were required to stay below deck in fear of the children being seen and questioned why they were not at school. The other boat was off the shore of Marin County. The women were controlled so much by Wesson that they would be required to row him to and from shore every day, sometimes multiple times a day. At one point, the family also lived in a trailer and large army tent in the Santa Cruz Mountains where there was no electricity or running water. They stayed in the mountains for a couple of years because of the seclusion. In 1989, Wesson was convicted of welfare fraud and perjury and went to jail in 1990. When he got out, the family was able to buy a rundown office building that they used instead for a home. The school bus that they owned sat outside of their new home. The neighbors didn't see the family all that often. They stated that the older members of the family would leave the house with Wesson, but the relationship between the woman and Wesson was never known. They did not know how many children were living in the home because they rarely saw the children. The neighbors thought that the family was quiet but extremely weird with Wesson being occasionally violent to the woman. One neighbor recalls seeing Wesson and some of the older women working on the bus in front of the house. When one of the women stepped away from the bus, they were forcibly pulled back by their shoulders or hair. There were not many adult children left in the house because when the children reached a certain age, they were required to leave the home. The only adult children that were left in the house were two of his daughters and one niece. They stayed in the home in order to help around the house and take care of the seven children. This brings us to March 12th, 2004. Wesson was approached by Ruby and Sophina, who were his nieces that had previously ran away from home. There was a rumor going around that Wesson wanted to relocate the family to Washington State where his parents were living at the time. The girls did not want him to leave with their two children, Aviv and Jonathan, so they confronted Wesson with the support of other family members. They asked Wesson for their kids back and Wesson refused. He was outraged at this and started to scream at the girls, calling them Judas, whores, and Lucifer. The women were getting nowhere, so they decided to leave and call the police, who showed up at the scene believing that this was a child custody case. The police went to talk to Wesson, who was very compliant. They talked and he asked to go back inside and collect the children, say goodbye, and get their things. The police agreed and Wesson went back inside. He was inside for around an hour, with the family begging the police to go check on the children. The police were unable to because they did not have a warrant to go inside the property. Elizabeth showed up to the scene and went inside the house. With hands shaking, she opened the door to the back bedroom and what she saw still haunts her to this day. The room was dimly lit, but she saw Wesson kneeling with his arm around their 17-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. She stated that her daughter just looked at her with a look of defeat. This terrified her. Wesson yelled for her to come here as if she were in trouble, but instead she ran out of the house. To this day, she said that she regrets this most of all. This would be the last time that anyone would see the children alive. Elizabeth ran out of the front door and a short time later, witnesses heard gunshots. The police claimed that they did not, but they got the SWAT team called. SWAT started to surround the house to gain entry when the front door opened and Wesson came out surrendering covered in blood. After a two-hour standoff, the ordeal was finally over. The police charged inside. In one of the rooms, they found 10 antique coffins that Wesson bought at an antique shop a couple of years ago. In the next room, the police discovered a pile of bodies in the corner of the room stacked on top of each other. It took police officers hours to confirm the number of dead because they were so compacted together and entwined in clothes. Once they were able to separate the bodies, the police were shocked at the realization that Wesson had killed his entire family. There were nine bodies that were discovered. Two of them were Wesson's older daughters, Sabrina, 25, and Elizabeth, 17. And seven of them were their children, Illabella, 8, Aviv, 7, Jonathan, 7, Ethan, 4, 
Marshi 1, Leva 1, and Sedona 1. Each victim was shot once through the eye and there didn't seem to be a struggle of any kind. It is believed that Wesson had a suicide pact with his daughter and niece, stating that if the family was to ever be broken up, they would kill the rest of the family and then themselves. The police on scene were so traumatized by everything that was going on that some of them had to be placed on administrative leave while others were placed into counseling. They were seen taking each body out of the house with some of the children being so small that they were being cradled in the officer's arms. At Wesson's trial, his defense presented that his daughter Sabrina was the one who committed the murders, including her own son, Marshy, and then committed suicide. The defense argued that since there was no struggle, the children died at the hands of someone that they trusted, which was the older daughter, Sabrina. They also argued that since the gun was found near her body and that there was gun residue on her hands, that she was the killer. Even with this defense, he was still convicted of murder because it is believed that he brainwashed the children so much that he was able to persuade the children to enter into a suicide pact. Some of the older children who left the house stated that he told his niece Rosa and daughter Sabrina that they were strong soldiers that would hunt down and kill family members who betrayed him and that they might have to kill the family and themselves to prevent the breakup of the family. Wesson was convicted of nine counts of first degree murder and 14 counts of forcible rape and molestation of his seven daughters and nieces. He was sentenced to death on June 27, 2005, and now resides in San Quentin State Prison to live out the rest of his life. The link to the five-minute version will be in the description below. This is 5-Minute Crimes Extended. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.